exactly that challenge. Uh, as many of you know, there was widespread protests that actually caused the resignation, drove the resignation of the then governor, uh, Ricardo Rosselló, uh, to step down. And it's very interesting to look at that historic event in the context of culture. Uh, you were talking about a new generation that essentially realized that they were being left out of the economic development of the island because they were not part of this infamous Telegram Gate group uh, that was making fun of the entire uh, political machinery and, and actually the people of Puerto Rico. But I think deeper than that, uh, you talk about culture, about uh, this, this cultural awareness. I think there is a new generation that was embarrassed that they would be essentially associated with that type of activity. And we are seeing a new generation that is hungry for transparency, is hungry for justice and fairness. And that translates directly into holding those values very, very high in any organization. And I, that's why I like the fact that ethics and transparency is the first pillar among many in the chief cultural officer, because I think it is the necessary condition for any transformation. John? I Yes, I came into the business world very much by accident. I was in Okinawa, vice president of the American University Extension there, and realized we were doing international training for these young people, young Okinawans, and there were no jobs for Okinawans in Okinawa, I mean, international jobs for in Okinawans in Okinawa. So I had a good friend that had created the World Trade Center in Portland, Oregon, and I thought, well, this was an independent trading kingdom for centuries, and perhaps through regaining this cultural background and, and foundation through the World Trade Center, we could we could bring the dignity back to the people of Okinawa. So that's how we got started in the, uh, I became aware of the international business, the power of the international business community, and especially uh, through the cultural uh, awareness and uh, cultural uh, explanation of, of a place. Then, uh, I was in Okinawa when 9-11 happened, and uh, the, uh, this, my necktie, by the way, I bought in the basement of the Twin Towers, uh, just to tell you how old it is, so I only wear it for very special occasions, uh, so today I felt it was very special. Uh, and the Twin Towers came down, the Twin Towers was the headquarters of the network of World Trade Centers. There, there's six in Florida, there, there are 50 in the United States, 40 now in China, they're all, they're all, all over the world. And I was pretty shocked. In Okinawa, I couldn't call back to the headquarters. There was no phone, no email, no idea what happened. Uh, two floors in the Twin Towers were the headquarters. And I was at that same time that week teaching a training course for the, the GATI, the military officers of the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. And uh, they were coming up to me every day, how are you going to retaliate? What's America going to do? How are you going to end? I had no idea what, I mean, the TVs were blaring and I had these two big uh, monitors there and I'd have to go out into the hallway and just weep. I didn't, I, I didn't know what to do. And then an inspiration finally came that we should make a World Trade Center in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. It's because of the isolation that made them dangerous. And, and if we could establish a trade center, there'd be automatic instant connection with 300 other trade centers in 100 countries. So that, that project did happen. We're kind of under reorganization right now in Afghanistan, and that's a very challenging place to do business. But business is the only sustainable, that's another one of the pillars, sustainability, uh, uh, peace-building models. The, every other effort for, for uh, peace or for uh, economic uh, development, whatever, it's. It's only last as long as it's sustainable, as long as the uh, the support is there, the the uh, uh, the government support. So business, what uh, the, what makes you know what makes something sustainable is something that generates revenue, and only business generates revenue. So sustainability is definitely dependent on business. Sustainability and peace are. Uh, Business is the best uh, model, or best vehicle to see those come about. Thank you, John. You know, I want to say that um, we talk a lot about diversity, right? Most businesses, 
Have you noticed that? There's an increase in our, you know, the importance of diversity, having diversity officers in almost every major organization has one or a few or a staff. And I always wonder, you know, how do we get there? Because I think that there's, there's a deep connection. As I was listening to the Dean, I was thinking of NOVA and all the other universities. Culture and education are intimately tied to each other. And how do you educate someone for this kind of position unless you've got the academic system to do it? And so one of the things that I, that I wanted to say is that I, you know, my first day in television, I went into 22 countries in Latin America. So there's this Cuban American kid from Miami, right? Born in Puerto Rico, raised in Miami, conceived in Spain, it's all true. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, I have to speak to 22 different countries in a language that they understand. And people think you speak Spanish, you speak Spanish. Well, yeah, you speak Spanish, but there's 21 versions of it throughout Latin America in the sense that we don't all say the same things, right? And there's some words that I would say in Miami that I can't say in Puerto Rico, because in Puerto Rico they're a bad word. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would say in Miami that I can't say in Mexico, and that was the majority of my audience. And so I became aware that it's not just enough to be culturally sensitive to diversity. You must be educated for diversity. You must be educated for this. So I, I, I greatly appreciate the presence of educators here, because I think the future lies in that kind of education where you know, uh, we can't just talk about diversity, we gotta do the work of diversity and the work of culture. And that leads me to this next thing, and maybe Danielle, you can start us up on this. It's the actual meat and potatoes of it. How crucial do you think the art of human and cultural connectivity in global business and interpersonal relations is? Yeah, uh, it's massive, it's huge, and I can talk to you from a, 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 an organizational level, a nonprofit. Uh, if you talked about sustainability and revenue. A revenue, you're only going to achieve it as profit if you offer a product or a service that makes life better for people. If there's demand for that product, because it improves their lives. That's why they're giving you their money, because you're, you're giving them a product or a service that makes their life better. And, and very similar to a nonprofit organization is if we're going to be driving ideas, because that's what I sell, is ideas, uh, policy uh, solutions, is to make their life better. And people even vote to decide whether this person or that person will make my life better. Which one is going to do it best? And that's how they vote. So and to get back to your point, I wanted to preface by saying that because when we were launching our organization back in June of 2011, it was going to be national. I knew that already. We're already in 10 states. We have about 70 employees. We're partnered with Americans for Prosperity, which have 500 employees uh, and about 3.5 million volunteers. So we have a lot of folks. Now, here's the thing. I wasn't going to hire all Mexicans because, you know, we're, we're, even though we're doing outreach to the Latino community and we're 60% of the Latino population, I also understand getting to the diversity of, of, our, of our community is that women have different priorities maybe than men. Youth, the millennials, have different priorities maybe than adults. Faith organizations or people of faith have different priorities. Mm -hmm. Business owners have different priorities. In the Latino world, it's no different. I mean, you're talking about age, gender, economic status, educational status. Everything matters, and everything uh, uh, filters the way they receive information and what they think about the priorities that are impacting their lives. So for me to be, um, to connect with, with the uh, Cuban community in Miami, I hired a Cuban. Um, and to connect with Col Colombianos, a Colombian. Uh, with women, a woman. Diversity is also, uh, um, the messenger is also as important as the message sometimes. Why? Because they can relate to them in a very real way. They've experienced the same things that they have and maybe even the priority issues are the same. And so they speak to them on their priorities, on their cultural experiences, and their American experiences as well in order to connect. Because it is about connecting. Now of course there's universal messaging. We use our social media platforms. We have over one million followers on Facebook and a ton and on Twitter and all these other things. And so we have a sort of a universal type of messaging. I'm the president and, and the chief spokesperson for the organization. But there's no question that at the very local level, that connectivity is, much, is made much more effective to the messengers that we hire because of the diversity that, that, that is able to connect in a more efficient, effective way. 
I, uh, I'm smiling because you asked a question and I just remember the story that's one of my favorite stories of my career. My last job in the military was being the commander at Air Force's Test Pilot School, which is the best job on the planet. It's a co combination of uh, running your own fighter squadron, being a dean of a graduate school, and owning your own monster brush. Uh, <laughs> you can fly an airplane you want, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, and we had our holiday party. And I remember that one of the young uh, men in our unit was a little myth that we still call a holiday party instead of a Christmas party. And, and I had this great speech planned, and as people started walking in, I realized I, I need to come up with a better speech. And uh, the speech, I won't go into all the details, but uh, it was basically the reason why we're having a holiday party is because in this gathering we have a guy who is Buddhist, a guy who is Hindu, uh, several people who are Jewish, uh, uh, many of our gals are, are Catholic, and uh, a bunch of, you know, Protestant Christians. And I could see people looking around the room going, I had no idea, like trying to figure out who's the Buddhist guy, you know? Um, but it was, uh, and the whole point of the speech, which I wrote on a napkin in two minutes because I was so inspired by realizing that, was that that is what made us better. And we, you know, many people will think, oh, you know, you're the military, you guys all look alike. I will guarantee you that if you went to that unit, you would be surprised at how many nationalities, how many women were there, how many folks from all sorts of countries, uh, some allied partners uh, that contributed. And I distinctly remember uh, this one guy coming back to me afterwards, and he goes, I had no idea. And I am so proud of now realizing, he was almost embarrassed. I had no idea that that is what made us so special. And it was a very moving moment because these people worked so well together because they respected each other. That it was almost like this, this cultural diversity was on a second plane and nobody realized that that was actually the source of a very deep strength and a deep capability that we had. And I remember that as being an inflection point in, the, in, the, in my tenure there, where folks started looking at each other with a little bit more curiosity and respect and really trying to understand what everybody else brought. The moral of the story, if you want to have a really high performing organization, you want to get about as many different minds as you can in that room, and culture makes you think in different ways. That is a competitive advantage that you just can't live without. And to jump up what the colonel said, I think that education is key for this component of cultural sensitivity. But as the colonel said, there's some basic intrinsic elements that you need to possess inside uh, that should come naturally, such as respect, such as being uh, generally sensitive and, and uh, appreciate the differences with other cultures. Those you cannot learn in education, but uh, education is definitely a starting uh, ground. But respect, being sincere, so on and so forth, those are key elements in order to move forward with uh, the integration of the uh, cultural sensitivity. And on the point of connectivity, everybody just high five one another. We can't see you from up here, but person next to you, just give them a high five. We've got to connect. We can uh, connect right here. Thank you. And the, because you are really the program. The, uh, what's going on here at Fitzius is really remarkable. And there's like every culture represented. The whole world is here. And uh, a, a great model, by the way, is Guyana. I think uh, half of the city of Georgetown is here in in uh, Fort Lauderdale right now, it seems like. A huge exhibit over there. And please go visit. One lady's making uh, trash to art is her, is her vision. And what a better metaphor could you find for what the work we're talking about today and what we're doing. But uh, take the time here to connect. Another thing about Guyana is really interesting. Uh, I, I found that uh, doing business with Guyana is challenging because you know, in America, we will elect the Christians to Christmas and uh, uh, have uh, the Jewish people do the uh, Passover and the holidays, and then uh, the Muslims can have Eid uh, Mubarak, and we'll, we'll celebrate that way. But in, uh, in Guyana, there are six very robust religious traditions, and everybody celebrates all of the holidays. They're not to separate them out. So they all, it's, I think, the most engaged interfaith 
community on Earth, and I, I'm just learning about that recently. It makes it challenging there, but it's also uh, very, very exciting. I think that's great. One of the things, we have a few more minutes, um, so I would like us to begin to wrap up. But one of the things I want uh, to give you an opportunity to speak about is to speak to one of the pillars that, that means something special to you. Uh, I think, you know, Don, just, you brought up a little bit of sustainability right now because, you know, art, you know, trash to, to art or, or vice versa. I think that's one of the things we're not too accustomed to. We talk about being green, but we're not doing that yet. Uh, we still throw a lot out. This is a society of waste. But uh, are there any of these pillars that really call out to you something that, that you would like to share? Um, we just have like one or two minutes for each. Art? Well, uh, the foreign, the foreign uh, policy is what I would highlight. Um, I believe that you know, it really encapsulates what we have been talking about here, uh, respect and being mindful of uh, each of, uh, of us. And, and incorporating that cultural um, sensitivity into the business world um, in the global economy makes sense. Yes. I, I would, uh, my current job is to catalyze investment in emerging markets, uh, ensuring that it's done in an ethical and sustainable manner. And, and those are two of the main pillars in this uh, chief cultural officer concept. I really believe that if we are truly honest about sharing the benefits of, of inspired ethical trade with the world, you really need to have transparency and sustainability as core pillars in any endeavor you have. Otherwise, we're just repeating the sins of the past. And the world is becoming a, a very small, interconnected place, and the success of our neighbor is our success. So really, for your sake, for the sake of your family, your children, your grandchildren, generations to come, and the well-being of everybody else and the only planet that we know of, uh, that we live in, we really need to have a much broader, insightful, enlightened approach to investment. And I think the pillars that we have addressed are a very positive first step towards that. John. So, in overview, I, I think all those pillars are very important. And just back to the chief cultural officer, I was thinking of uh, every year in August, our family gets together in a small town in Pennsylvania where my parents come from. And I have a cousin who joined the military before he finished high school and never did go back to finish. And uh, I was talking to him last year, and, and I told him I was working on this project in Korea with the North Korea issue, and he said, oh, I was in, I've been to Korea many times, and I said, well, what was that about? And he, he had grown up through the, you know, he had gotten a job in a pharmaceutical company and, and worked really from the bottom up and never did get back for education. But he said they had opened, a, they, they had a subsidiary, bought a plant in Korea, he said, and, uh, and they kept sending managers over there, and then the, the people would come back and be so angry and so upset, and they said, he said, there was this guy, Mr. Kim, over there that was just chewing up everybody they'd send over. So uh, he said, so they just ran out of people willing to go. And I was just, oh, I've never been there. I, I'd like to see, well, they all go see uh, Mr. Kim. So he said, but I won. He said, I, I, uh, I, I totally, you know, I got the victory and I, I became very famous in the company. I said, well, how, what, what did you do? He said, well, I... He said, I, I did a little research and, and I walked over there and I saw... I walked into the plant and there was Mr. Kim with a scowl on his face and, and he said, uh, I just looked him right in the eye. I took his hand and shook his hand and I said, Anyangha Shindika, which means, how are you in Korean? He said, when he, when he said that, uh, Mr. Kim's face just broke and a big smile came out. He said, oh, come, he brought him to his family that evening and, he, and, uh, and, and uh, built the whole uh, foundation of this huge success for that company. But my cousin had no education, but because of business, there's no way to do business without cultural competency and without understanding. You have to build trust. Without trust, there's nothing else. And, and so uh, there is no way around the absolutely mandatory uh, awareness of a, a cultural. A cultural officer is just a great way to point that out and make companies and the broader society aware of the significance of it.
but it's unavoidable with business. You can't do business without, without that. Uh, trade and economic opportunity. Uh, trade because I think it uh, speaks to our interdependence between the countries. Uh, and when there's trade, there's trust, there's familiarity. Um, and I think it, it creates bonds. Um, and so war is, is lessened, or the possibility of war, uh, between countries that trade, the people that know each other and are familiar with each other. So I love trade. Economic opportunity, because let's just be frank, without the sufficiency or the accumulation of capital, uh, it's difficult to advance um, the kind of pursuits that, you, that, that or your aims. Um, to um, advance charitable work, ministerial work, um, peace work. Uh, resources means a lot. And so when, when I think when there's economic opportunity, there's also independence of the individual. Look, um, I don't want to depend on politicians. I really don't. I, there's a role for government, but I don't want to depend on government either. And the only way you can do that is by being economically independent uh, as individuals and as groups. Uh, and so I, I believe in, in trade and economic opportunity. Excellent. Well, you know, effective communication is a big part of, of all of this. And I think we've had four excellent, very effective communicators up here on this stage today. So let's thank them for their participation and their great contributions to this uh, conversation. Uh, I feel very honored to have uh, Mar